Welcome to Talk Politics. I'm Ken Rockburn. On this week's program, the groups who receive money from the Department of National Defense defend themselves against charges that they are propagandists. We'll also take a look at the foreign policies of Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton, and we'll meet the author of a scathingly funny political satire set right here in political Ottawa. All that ahead on Talk Politics. Stay with us. Political intrigue, sex scandals, backroom deals, a rogue Tory minority government, a reluctant curmudgeonly rookie liberal member of parliament, and oh yes, a hovercraft. These are all ingredients in this novel. It's called The Best Laid Plans, written by former political aide, now communications and public affairs consultant, Terry Fallis, who joins me in the studio. Thanks for coming in, Terry. Thanks for having me. Um, this is this your first novel, and, you, and you're not a novelist by profession, are you? I am not. <laughs> no. What, made you, what was it that made you want to write a novel? Well, writing a novel has been on my life list since I was in high school, just something I always wanted to do. And as a serial procrastinator, it's taken me uh, some 30 years after that <laughs> high school revelation uh, to get it done. But I uh, always wanted to write. I'm a, a big reader, uh, and I love to read novels that uh, make me laugh and, and make me feel good. So all the political content in here, and it is rife with political content, comes from your years working provincially and federally? Yes, I worked on Parliament Hill in the... Uh, in the mid 80s and uh, in, at Queen's Park uh, with the, uh, the Peterson government and so it is drawn from that experience uh, I'm not recreating anything that happened to me it, it really is a fictional right. account uh, but the uh, the process and the parliamentary procedure and uh, the political intrigue that springs from my experience on, in politics. Yeah. The, did, how long did it take you to map out the storyline for this because you get, it, it, gets, uh, it gets complex yeah, it took me, uh, well, the first half of the novel is really based on a short story I wrote uh, probably around 2000 or 2001, uh, and just an idea that, uh, that appealed to me, and I decided to blow it out into a, into a, a longer novel. Uh, but it probably took me a couple of years of it just rattling around and fermenting right. in my mind. Uh, the actual writing, once I had it all laid out, because I'm sort of an outliner by nature, I think okay. it's the engineering side of me, <laughs> everything's got to be laid out methodically. Right. So when I started to write, it really only took me about, uh, about 10 months of uh, evenings and, and weekends and early mornings uh, yeah. to, to write. You know, it's interesting, I don't want to give the, the plot away, because it, it does, does build up to a nice little, little denouement at the end, which, uh, so we don't want to spoil that for people. But the, but the general idea here is that they've got to get somebody to run in a riding just outside of Ottawa, a liberal to run in a riding just outside of Ottawa, and the guy who's assigned to do this, who's sort of doing penance for something, uh, comes across this old fellow who teaches at the University of Ottawa and manages to convince him to do it. That's sort of it in a nutshell. Uh, but as I was reading it, I, I couldn't help but thinking, you say you worked in the Peterson government, I couldn't help thinking back to the days here in Ontario when Bob Ray and the New Democrats won, and I remember at the time, I knew people who had worked sort of behind the scenes who said, you know, they had polling captains who put their names up because they didn't have a candidate in the writing, and they won. Right. And suddenly they were shoved into this cauldron of politics, and they didn't know what the hell they were doing. You know? And I was reminded of that in here. You had a guy who reluctantly goes in, but then sort of, when he's, once he's there, kind of... Accepts it. Yes, and, accepts it and grabs onto it. Yeah, it's true. I, uh, I was there during those years, uh, and or shortly before the, the NDP came to power, and I remember those stories of people who... Uh, went to bed on election night uh, as a potent or a, uh, a, usually a sacrificial lamb in a right. riding that had never been held by the NDP, and woke up the next morning, went to the shop floor, cleaned out their locker, and some some of them moved into cabinet, and so and that may have been a good thing. Uh, yeah, it was or, an, or maybe not. Action. <laughs> or maybe <laughs> not. But I'm not uh, sure that Bob Ray would think it was a good thing now, but <laughs> perhaps, still, he's trying to forget not. that part of his life. Uh, but that was in the back of my mind. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, it, it was. It's an interesting scenario yeah. where someone who had yeah. no intention of, of serving but was achieving another end by throwing his name in, in, the, in the novel. It's kind of a, uh, a deal he strikes. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. You know, I, I was reminded, too, of the sort of political um, 
political comedy, but also a political drama that comes out of Great Britain, where, where their political material, their, their cultural entertainment material, when it has to do with politics, deals with a lot of this sort of stuff, the minutia of things that you wouldn't think was that uh, interesting until you put the structure of a story around it. Or I think of the West Wing, right, right in the States, which took stuff that if you describe it to somebody, they go, well, why are you watching that? It sounds so boring, but they made it not boring. In this country, my sense is that when, when somebody writes about writes a political thriller or something, thriller would be the key word, there always has to be some big international conspiratorial element to it. Right. Other than that, like there has to be a big, you know, big picture kind of thing. Right. And there isn't a lot of this sort of stuff. What do you think that is? Yeah, it's interesting. We don't have a grand tradition of political fiction in this country. I'm not really sure why. I've I've thought about that a lot over the years, and I was a big fan of Richard Romer's uh, novels, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, but we really haven't seen a, a lot of, of political fiction in this country. I'm not really sure why. But you're right, the British and the American political fiction, there's usually, you know, brinksmanship between the Soviets and the, uh, the Americans, and the world hangs in the balance. This is a much more uh, subtle ride, and uh, there isn't a huge political uh, issue at stake in this. Yeah. It's, a, it's really a, a story, an amusing story, I hope, of characters that are endearing. There are some climaxes and a story arc of some description, yeah. I, I hope. Uh, but if you're interested in politics, I hope you can read it on a slightly different level, understand that there are some questions raised about the state of our democracy and, and how politics works and how government yeah. works. And now, there's a, fair amount, <coughs> there's a fair amount of political cynicism in this book from a lot of the characters, too. Does that come straight out of you? Well, I, I try not to be cynical. I arrived on Parliament Hill in, in 1984, uh, sort of fresh-faced and, and full of political idealism, hoping to to do what was right for the country and all of that. And uh, once you get into the mill of politics, it, it can beat you down and sort of pummel that idealism uh, out of you. So there is some cynicism. I think it's cynicism that's reflected in uh, Canadians in general as they look at, uh, at their politicians and, and their government. So it is a book about cynicism, but I hope it's redeemed by uh, some of the characters yeah. as they try and overcome that which has been politics as usual. You know, it's funny. That just recently I, I was interviewed by a, a grad student in university who was doing a paper on uh, the, the difference in, in, uh, in political reporting between skepticism and cynicism. And, and it, it, do you cross that line? And if you do, when do you cross it? And I, I, hadn't, I hadn't really thought about it until somebody had asked me. Uh, but there, at a certain point, you do kind of cross the line. You feel, you feel like every story that unfolds in, in front of you, either in the hallowed halls of this place or on the, in the pictures behind us, or right. even at a provincial or municipal level, that you've heard them all before. And you start getting very jaded about it. Yeah, you do. And it's, uh, there's plenty of, of evidence uh, of that and plenty of reasons, I think, to be jaded. At, but I hope, we're, I hope we're not past the brink of reclaiming uh, our democracy and, and our politics. But I think it's, it's, in a way, inbred in the system when you look at our four-year electoral horizon, the need to get reelected, and uh, the focus or the incentives that it gives governments to do things that perhaps benefit them in the short term, but perhaps aren't in the longer term interests. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're looking for the, the quick hit. And uh, I regret that that's the case, but you know, democracy is always going to be imperfect because it is managed and governed by humans and we are innately imperfect so but as Winston Churchill said uh, to paraphrase him, I think he said something like democracy is the worst form of government except for all yes, the others, all the others yeah. and in a way that's what we're left with but uh, yeah <clears throat> or to, to quote uh, Tommy Lee Jones from No Country for Old Men the sure is a mess he says well if it isn't it'll do till the mess gets here um, <laughs> T tell me about defining the characters in the book. Uh, I mean, I, I guess that over the years, you came across people that if you're thinking, if, if you always wanted to write something like this, you're storing away in the back of your mind characteristics of certain people and thinking, well, that would be good later on down the line. I might incorporate that somewhere. But, when, but I, I know this from, from talking to writers over the years uh, who have said that one of the hardest things when you're doing something novelistically is to maintain the distinction between your characters and maintain the distinction in their voices. Is it any easier when you're dealing with the sort of black and white world, sort of, of political parties at least, that you could you, you could keep them separate in, in those silos? Yeah, it made it a little easier, I think, because uh, satire, uh, is, everything's a little bit bigger and exaggerated yeah. in, in satire, so I could draw clearer distinctions, I think, between the villains and, and the good guys. 